Namaste investors. Do you know that in the past five to seven years, despite the advent of UPI and digitalization, India may cash in circulation has increased consistently in the past five to seven years. And this is the proof that cash is a real king. And that's why we invited the management of Radiant Cash Management Systems to help us understand that cash in circulation is rapidly increasing. ये कैश मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम की इंडस्ट्री कैसे वर्क करती है रीडेंट कैश मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम्स का जन्म कैसे हुआ था एंड कैसे वो लोग लास्ट 5 7 इयर्स में ऑपरेट कर रहे हैं एंड फ्यूचर में उनको क्या आउटलुक दिखता है रिगार्डिंग द कंपनी एज वेल एज दिस द ओवरऑल इंडस्ट्री सो डू वॉच दिस सेशन थैंक यू हेलो एवरीवन आई एम अंकित कानोडिया फ्रॉम स्मार्ट सिंग सर्विसेज अ सेबी रजिस्टर्ड इन्वेस्टमेंट एडवाइजरी फर्म वेलकम टू द फोर्थ एपिसोड ऑफ मिशन स्माइल Leaders Ka Falsafa. Leaders Ka Falsafa is an initiative from Mission Smile where we call promoters or top management of listed businesses in India and learn from their journeys, struggles and victories. For those who are watching this for the first time, Mission Smile stands for making new stock market investors learn it through engaging research. Before we begin, I would request everyone to please keep yourself on mute and switch off the video so that we can have a seamless discussion and soak in all the wisdom. You may type in your questions on the chat box. We'll take the most relevant questions at the end of the session. So let's begin. In our fourth episode of Leaders Ka Falsafa, we have Mr. N. Muthuraman, who is Director, Strategy and Head of Investor Relations in Radiant Cash Management Services. Incorporated in 2005, Radiant Cash Management Services is a market leader in retail cash management services for banks, financial institutions, organized retail, and e-commerce companies in India. The company offers a range of services under this segment consisting of collection and delivery of cash on behalf of its clients from the end user. As a responsible SEBI registered investment advisors, we are SmartSync Investment Advisory Services would wish to make this disclosure before the start of the event. I and my family are invested in the business of Radiant Cash Management and we at SmartSync Services have recommended this business to our h &I and retail customers to buy. Second, we have received no compensation from the management of Radiant to conduct this session. So please consider this discussion as an opportunity to know more about the business and nothing we discuss today should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell the business. With the important disclosures out of the way, I would now let Mr. Muthuraman to do the talking. Thank you, sir, for agreeing to do this for the investor community. Good morning, Ankit. Uh, very happy to uh, be here and uh, talk to you and your uh, <clears throat> like-minded investors. We'll be happy to provide as much details, keeping in mind that uh, uh, we are in a uh, a silent period, so no unpublished prices or information shall be disclosed in this call. But we'll be happy to provide details about our operations and our journey and uh, our business and uh, etc. Uh, and address any questions that you or your investors may have. Thank you so much, sir. So as I promised to you, uh, we'll not ask any question related to quarterly guidance or what is going to be in this uh, Q4. Uh, so I straight away go go to the first question. So uh, Mr. Muthuraman, please take us down memory lane to 2005 when the company got started. I guess Deutsche Bank was the first bank to give us our first contract or order. Tell us a little bit about the early days of struggles, achievements and opportunity landscape until we became a pan-India player in the year 2010 with about 10,000 service funds. Okay, yeah. So I am actually uh, speaking here on behalf of Colonel David Devasahayam, the founder, chairman, and managing director of uh, Radiant Cash Management. Uh, I am associated with the company for the last six years. So obviously, I was not there on the day uh, when the business started, but we'll definitely provide you with the details how it all started. Uh, in, I think in uh, Colonel joined uh, Army in 1980. So straight for 25 years, he served in uh, a most difficult of uh, uh, terrains 
including Northeast and uh, in Kashmir uh, and uh, several other places. And in 2003 or four, he got posted in uh, Bangalore uh, of, upon his request uh, to command a training center. And then uh, due to some family circumstances, he took a voluntary retirement. And uh, so Army has this practice of uh, those who have committed uh, that, uh, the full pension requirement, they provide what is called as a resettlement course. So where they arrange various industry leaders to come and talk to those who are opting uh, from to, for civilian service, what are the opportunities available for these uh, 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 Army retirees? So this there was uh, one such event where somebody from Reserve Bank of India came and spoke about uh, spoke to the uh, spoke to the uh, retirees uh, for resettlement. And usual practice for uh, army veterans is to start a man guarding company, security services company. So uh, this person spoke about uh, this thing, saying that security companies we have enough and more, but uh, there is another. Uh, uh, emerging segment, which is uh, uh, retail cash management, where there is hardly one or two players at that point of time. And uh, RBA needs a lot more people in that segment. And it is uh, a reasonably lucrative segment of the uh, cash management, uh, this thing. So he, uh, Colonel caught on to that and uh, took more uh, uh, details from him and uh, consulted several uh, subject matter experts and realized that this is a fairly lucrative segment within the cash management uh, industry. And uh, yes, he started the company with uh, 10 lakhs of his retirement savings. And uh, like you said, yes, Deutsche Bank was the first client and uh, in Coimbatore for, I think, uh, uh, Tata Tele or you know, Tata Tele, uh, this thing, cash collections, just two points in Coimbatore and Thirupur. So uh, from that point, uh, the thing, the biggest constraints or challenge at that point of time is that banks will ask for a hundred percent bank guarantee for the every amount that they collect. Because at the end of the day, this is a startup company. So uh, how will you trust large volumes of cash without a corresponding backup? So his constraints for growth at that point of time was largely the margin money that he has to pay towards bank guarantees. So he had used his uh, this thing and some friends and relatives and uh, uh, some external borrowings, etc. And that's how it started from 2005. And uh, uh, because the service is nascent and it is offered by uh, select multinational banks only to their privileged customers as a value-added service. So uh, business was continuing to come and he was able to take up only to the extent his capital allowed him to. And he scaled it up uh, reasonably well uh, from 2005 to 2010, where he had a, already had a pan-India presence, but a very sparse presence. So at that point of time, he decided that he needed a, a management education. He couldn't, uh, uh, <clears throat> as in a sense, his, uh, uh, he wanted to strengthen his awareness about best business practices, uh, financial uh, analysis, financial practices, uh, profitability, all of that. So he did a, a advanced management program at uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, it's a three-year program, and uh, <clears throat> while running the business, okay. So in U.S., daytime classes and nighttime managing the India operations. And uh, once he completed that, he realized that obviously even before he knew, but he realized that institutional funding is the one that institutional equity funding is what is needed at that point of time to scale up the company. So he appointed PwC and PwC got uh, Ascent Capital as a private equity investor. As in the business was growing well and profitable at that point of time as well. So there's enough interest from PE players. Ascent Capital was chosen because the founder of Ascent is uh, Saraja Kumar, who is former, formerly with SEBI. And in his tenure at SEBI, he had approved thousand DRHPs. So he promised that one day he will take the company public and that tilted the choice in favor of Ascent Capital. Ascent Capital uh, took 37% stake in 2000, January 2015 and then that helped the company scale further. 
Thank you, sir. That was very helpful. So before I come to the investment of uh, Ascent India Fund uh, in 2015, so I wanted to know more about the period between 2010 and 2015, because that was also a period where there was many things happening in the industry. How, how were we placed at that time and what were the main focus during uh, this period before the fund infusion happened? Yeah, so uh, that was a period of fairly high growth for the company. Uh, the I think at that point of time, 2010, the turnover was roughly about 50 crores or so. As in, uh, that is the minimum eligibility that you have to be a founder of a $10 million company to be a, to enroll into Harvard Management Program. So at that rupees, uh, 50 rupees per uh, dollar. So 50 crores was the uh, turnover. But business was rapidly growing because uh, the banks, as in the foreign banks first, and the new age private sector banks, that is your uh, ICICIs and Axis and uh, Indusins of the world, they were also growing rapidly and jostling for market share among uh, privileged customers. So they are offering this as a value added service to multiple banks. And for some reason, as in the competitors, were not as aggressive or as active in this market. At that point of time, there were only two players, I think Brings and CMS. They were not as active in this segment because each of them have, uh, for them, it is one of the other businesses, multiple businesses. So that gave a, a significant opportunity for Radiant to do, increase its market share within this segment. So uh, yes, he did raise a lot of uh, uh, capital uh, as in debt capital at high cost as well at that point of time, but uh, with a single point focus of uh, increasing the uh, root density. So we realized that at the point of time, as in a sense, adding points is one, but adding points in an existing routes to improve the density determines profitability. So uh, focused uh, business development for every contract he himself personally will sit and uh, this thing. So uh, that helped in uh, scaling up the business uh, in a very profitable manner. And uh, yeah, so that is the focus. I mean, there is no distraction. Uh, retail cash management is the single pointed focus for the company from 2005 to 2015. Yeah, thank you, sir. That was very helpful again. Uh, so as you mentioned that in 2015, we received an institutional investment for the first time. And it was the S, uh, Ascent India Fund, uh, which invested in our company. And in the same year, you acquired the ATM business from Checkmate. So I have a two-part question to this uh, situation. So first, the general understanding among the investor community is that when an institution invests, it not only gives you capital, but also gives you strategic input to running the business and the area to focus on growth. So my two questions are, what were the expectations of institution when they invested in your business? Number one. And number two, was buying ATM business of Checkmate also was a suggestion from their end or it was our call to go ahead with it to begin with? No. See, the, uh, the biggest value add that Ascent brought to the table was a, a significant uh, uh, focus and investment in our technology platform. So Ascent had made several uh, new age tech business investments, including Big Basket, etc. So they had rich experience, which helped uh, uh, us to focus and make investments in the technology platform. Okay, so in the early years, it was still fairly manual, but then as the scale up operation uh, scale up of operations happens, it becomes extremely difficult, and it's it through so technology in uh, in this business cash management business works both ways. One is for uh, improving the productivity and operating efficiency. And the other side of the coin is uh, uh, stringent risk management. So on both sides, uh, technology helps. So uh, Ascent focused more on uh, bringing focus more on uh, uh, implementing a strong technology platform. So every aspect of uh, uh, Radiance operations uh, was uh, uh, as an automated or uh, tech driven. Uh, from its uh, earlier manual days. The decision to in, to expand into ATM was, uh, as in, 
it's not just a single uh, this thing it's a board decision more importantly it was also from many of our customers so customers also uh, suggested that we we do uh, enter into that adjacent segment and uh, so it was actually not the same year it is almost one year later jan 2015 is when ascent came in jan 2016 is when we acquired the checkmate okay so okay. but uh, <clears throat> we acquired about 3000 atms uh, of checkmate the okay. as in fairly the price paid was only for the assets that we got that is the vehicle assets etc vehicles and vaults and uh, uh, cash counting machines and that kind of uh, it's practically a uh, just an asset purchase along with the contracts business contracts so uh, 3000 atms uh, as in within short period of time the company realized that uh, the atm business just like in the retail, retail cash management business, the profitability determines on root density. Okay, so we had 3,000 ATMs at that point of time. If all the 3,000 were in Tamil Nadu, that business would have been rolling in money. Unfortunately, it was not. It was spread uh, pan India. So it was uh, loss making uh, uh, from the time we acquired. And after uh, 12, 12, 12 to 18 months of uh, running that business and understanding that there is a very limited scope for improving the profitability, except through aggressive business growth. And aggressive business growth can come only through undercutting the competition. Whereas the retail cash management is continuing to grow at a very, fairly healthy pace. So the management decided, uh, the board decided that uh, to exit that business. That exiting that business did not mean that we sold that business. We just stopped taking fresh ATM contracts, served notice to all the uh, banks, and redeployed those assets. Basically, it was vans and computers and uh, people. So all of those were redeployed in the faster growing retail cash management business. So there is no uh, uh, write-off or loss or anything like that. Yes, some small debtors in business was written off at that point of time. Because uh, when you stop the business, uh, some uh, old disputes and etc. Some small amount of debtors was written off. But otherwise, the uh, acquisition price that we paid for was mainly for the vans and computers and things like that. Those were redeployed in our retail cash management business. And we stopped the business in January 2019. Yeah. So, sir, it's good that you clarified this because I remember reading in either uh, your R DRHP or maybe CMS Info DRHP where it was mentioned this business was sold at a loss. No. But now that you have clarified. No, no, it was sold it because it was loss making. That's what we had uh, yeah. asked. It was sold because it was loss so, making. Yeah. The, the acquisition yeah. price to selling price, there was no loss. Okay. Sold in the sense you said, no, you didn't sell no, the there business. Was no sell. There was no sale. Close of business. There was no sale. Close of business and yeah. redeployed the assets into our, uh, our retail cash management. Yes. Yeah. So this is something new I'm learning today because uh, in the DRHP it is mentioned that this business was sold at a loss. No. <laughs> so now uh, it becomes more clear. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now when we look at uh, look back to that business, uh, would you say selling the business help us get more focus back in our organization to cater to the fast growing? retail cash management space yeah so it was a good decision even today if i have to rewind and uh, uh, take a decision uh, would have been the this thing as in a better would have been to rewind it to 2016 and not do that acquisition at all in the first place right. but the second best would have been to uh, exit at the same time because Great. see uh, as a as, as in we have explained this uh, earlier as well root density determines profitability and in retail cash management, in uh, uh, an added complication in the ATM segment is that there is a managed service provider that comes between the bank and the service provider. So the MSP takes in charge of the entire ATM operations from appointing a security guard to maintaining the air condition to maintaining that machine and providing first level support to refill replenishment of cash to the switches and software and alerts and everything. Okay. So the MSP's mandate from the bank is to reduce the cost of operations. Okay. So they, in turn, 
obviously will squeeze all the vendors, including the cash replenishment guys. So there were times when I think initially when ATM replenishment started, and then I think per per replenish per ATM per month uh, rates were, I think I'm presuming uh, this thing as in based on market information, it was in the range of 35, 40,000 per month. Today it is uh, less than 10,000 rupees per month. Okay, so the uh, that is obviously that has come about by efficiency. That has come about through uh, uh, root density, and it has also come about through the MSPs squeezing the service providers and ensuring that sustainable level profits are allowed, but not super normal profits. Okay, so got it. To contrast that with the retail cash management business. So when I go through a route of picking up cash, I pick up first uh, outlet through ICICI Bank, and second outlet through Deutsche Bank, third outlet through Standard Chartered, fourth outlet through State Bank of India. ICICI couldn't care less where else I am going next. Deutsche Bank couldn't care less how many more points I am this thing I am picking up, as long as his time within the time during the day the cash reaches the bank account. That's all their expectation is. So if I could have multiple banks and I service multiple banks points in that same route, my profitability improves substantially. Obviously, if I'm doing for only one bank, the price that I charge will never be able to cover even my direct costs of that manpower and uh, fuel. I'm able to multiplex that assets through to service multiple banks outlets and hence, there is no direct correlation between the cost and revenue uh, as far as individual client is concerned. That is not true in the case of ATM. So the MSPs will know this is your cost of vehicle, this is your cost of driver, this is your route, this is the kilometers, this is your uh, fuel consumption rates, and this is your margin. So that kind of transparency in costing to pricing is there in ATM, which in a sense, limits the amount of profits that you can make. Whereas uh, in uh, retail cash management, that linkage is broken between cost and price. So uh, we, we are able to, so that is why retail cash management segment is among the more profitable segments in the cash logistics industry. This was very interesting. So if, just for the benefit of our uh, users who are watching us live and uh, probably will watch us uh, watch the recording as well. If I understood it correctly, in case of ATM business, what happens is that if you are taking, say, ICC Bank's money, you have to first finish the work related to that bank, and then only you can move to the other bank, right? You cannot do it simultaneously. Yeah. You, but in case of you usually uh, mixing up of cash of two different banks is not permitted in the ATM segment. Right, Whereas right, in right. Uh, retail cash management, that is always done. And there is no way you can service only one bank's points. You have to service multiple bank's points in the same boat. Ankit? Uh, Vikas, can you hear me? We'll just wait for Ankit to come back.
Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions that has come up is that, is there a possibility of a future regulation for retail cash management where you cannot mix uh, 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 cash of one to the other? Uh, very unlikely. Uh, because the the unit economics will still not work out uh, at all. And uh, in fact, the regulatory environment is quite uh, benign and supportive of retail cash management uh, because uh, uh, the regulator views this as an essential service. Even during COVID, for instance, retail cash management has been uh, uh, declared as an essential service. See, what happens is RBA calls this process as mop-up. So the when the cash, the forward movement is from the RBA uh, mint to RBI vault to bank vault to uh, bank branches uh, or to ATMs. It's a forward movement. These are bulk movement of cash. And then either through bank teller or through ATM, it reaches the body public. From body public, it should come back to the bank. That is the role where retail cash management and Radiant uh, uh, provides its service. So when we do that, we process that cash. So we identify soiled notes, cut notes, uh, counterfeit currencies. We sort them uh, in into ATM ready bundles. We sort the coins separately. Low denomination is dealt separately. So it gets processed before it reaches the bank. So that processing helps improve longevity of the currency. So RBI has a, something called as a clean note policy. So this fits in very well with the clean note policy where the well, RBI, by, by mandate of the government, RBI has a clean note policy where every note with the body public should be of acceptable quality. So they do a lot of uh, uh, reprinting, uh, uh, etc. So uh, this helps in improving the longevity of notes and also identify counterfeit notes, etc. So our regulator views this segment very benign. So that is point number one. Point number two, our service starts from as low as 2,000 rupees per point per month. So if it's a pharmacy, for instance, uh, in a tier one location, it's, our service starts from as low as 2,000 rupees per point per month. So which means that to visit that outlet 26 times a month, with the armed guards and driver and security and uh, with all the IT features and everything, that is like 75, 80 rupees per visit. If the bank, if the pharmacy has to do it on its own, it won't even cover the fuel cost for the person to go and deposit in the nearest bank. So we are able to afford that kind of pricing, a competitive pricing, because we are able to multiplex these assets across multiple banks. So if a regulation comes where you cannot allow this multiplex, then we have to charge that much more, which will mean that this uh, business will, as an individual outlet, will not be able to afford, which will mean that this, this much amount of cash doesn't get processed. So I don't expect any regulatory uh, surprise, negative surprise at all for this segment. If anything, it has been, as I said, very positively viewed uh, with the benign regulation uh, on this front uh, by regulators. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> while we wait for uh, Ankit to join, uh, one of the common questions that people uh, that we face uh, from many investors, uh, prospective investors, both institutional and individuals is that, what is the future of cash with the UPI growing at a breakneck speed? Uh, will cash even remain at all? And if, uh, 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 if cash goes out, what happens to your business? So natural question for anybody to expect. So uh, I will put uh, answer this in with some data points uh, to put things in perspective. India has two crore retail outlets. Okay. Uh, this you can just Google up. Uh, this was 1.2 crores about 10 years back. Today, this... Uh, so number of retail outlets is two crores. Our own estimate is that about 25% of this will be organized, some form of organized, which is which will be eligible to use a service of this nature. 
So that is 50 lakh outlets. We service about 75, 70,000 outlets now, roughly. The entire industry services less than one and a half lakh outlets. So where is two crores and where is 50 lakhs, which is eligible to use a service of this nature, and the entire industry is servicing only one and a half lakh outlets. I mean, this is a very nascent industry in India. It's a hundred year old industry elsewhere, in other developed markets. It's a very nascent industry. So the growth opportunity for us is going to come from more and more outlets, not more and more volume from existing outlets. So the same store sales growth, we are not anticipating any big numbers, but adding more stores will drive our growth for a long period of time to come. That's point number one. This is corroborated by other fact. So the at the time of demonetization, the currency in circulation was about 16 lakh crores, of which 14 lakh crores were demonetized. Today, the currency in circulation is 32 lakh crores. Develop that. Okay. So government realized that, as in despite demonetization and all of that, India has the reasonable uh, economy based on cash, and you cannot, uh, you cannot, as in yes, while at, at this time, in between 2016 to 24, there's a growth in the digital payments as well. So this two lakh crores growth is uh, there is a significant role that cash will on. The, the third point at course of currency, roughly the velocity of money is about five times. 60, 170 macro transactions happen in a year. We handled 1.5 crores of cash last year. The entire industry will be handled less than 4 lakh crores. So where is 170 lakh crores versus where is 4 lakh crores? That's about 2% or so. By, which, by penetration or by uh, volume of cash handle, penetration in terms of number of stores or volume of cash handled. Retail cash management is really in the nascent stage. The This business, retail cash management or the industry parlance the banking, we use it as doorstep banking, is a service that was started in India by foreign banks. Then later, new age private sector banks adopted this. Then the old private sector banks started adopting this. Now a few uh, small finance banks and a few cooperative banks have started adopting it. The biggest uh, uh, elephant in the room, which is public sector banks, except SBA, none of them offer this as a service to their clients yet. If you are a customer of Canara Bank, Canara Bank expects you to come to the bank branch and deposit your cash. They won't come to your doorstep to pick up cash, either directly or through a service provider. So that is a huge market that is waiting to be tapped, either by these public sector banks start offering this as a service because of competitive pressures, or providers like us providing uh, service to those customers directly. So that provides for a long-term growth opportunity. Yes, digital banking, uh, penetration of digital banking will have an impact in terms of the currency in circulation may not grow as fast. But as I said, that is a worry for 50 years down the line because at this point of time, our penetration is less than 2% and the number of stores that are eligible to use the service is very large. And more importantly, no store is going to go zero cash as in uh, EDS. It will have all the payment mechanisms and still some part of it uh, in, in every store will have cash element and that need to find its way to the bank. And hence, there is a scope for service for trading. US is like 62% or 68% digital uh, this thing, but still it is a fairly large business for Brings and Loomis to provide retail cash management service or doorstep banking service in US. So developed markets, 
uh, still have this as a service and we are nowhere near uh, that kind of digital penetration. So uh, we, we believe uh, uh, there's a significantly large uh, scope for growth. And more important, about 67% of our revenues come from uh, uh, tier three plus towns and uh, cities. So the digital penetration is still fairly high in uh, uh, tier one and tier two, but still uh, very low penetration in tier three plus locations. So all of these will mean that it's going to provide a significant uh, runway for growth for a uh, long period to come. Vikas or somebody, should we check uh, if uh, Ankit is back? So uh, while we wait for Vikas, we will just take a few more questions in the chat box. Will what denomination currency be good for business? As in, uh, see, during the demonetization, actually bringing in the new currency and flushing out the old currency provided us additional business. So there is no big uh, uh, increase or drop in our uh, business volume. Uh, extraordinary because of demonetization. But, but yes, uh, a lower denomination is practically phased out and it is only 500 uh, is the highest denomination. Uh, it's good for our business as in, in the sense more volume of uh, cash to be handled and hence uh, some of our charges are actually based on the number of nodes. So like cash processing is based on number of notes that we process, et cetera. So that improves our business to a marginal extent, but otherwise uh, there is no big major impact. The next question is what would be the entry barriers for new entrants here or existing competitors like CMS, Info, et cetera, not to take the market share? So there is an entry barrier. There's a regulatory entry barrier. Uh, RBI through its uh, regulation in 2018 has mandated that uh, a minimum net worth of 100 crores and a minimum fleet size of 300 vans for any player to provide the service. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, uh, because large volumes of bio, uh, RBI wants only the regulated players to provide the service. So we are not regulated directly by RBI, but uh, RBI regulates banks that they cannot outsource this activity to players who do not meet this criteria. Minimum net worth of 100 crores and a minimum fleet size of 300 vans. But that is not the biggest entry barrier. The biggest entry barrier is the nature of this business. Like I said, how we were distant third in ATM segment and we were never able to be profitable and we exited that business. So likewise for any new player, to achieve a root density is going to take time and until such time it is going to be business is going to be bleeding. So the nature of this business is like a natural oligopoly, like any other utility business. If there is one player who is providing that service and second player who is providing that service in that route, there is limited business for the third player to come and uh, uh, get pick up uh, uh, more, more stores in that same route. Or it will take time for the third player to uh, achieve profitability in the truth. So as it is, the pricing per customers are really low. And then I said, we start with as low as 2000 rupees per month. So unless somebody reaches that uh, uh, adequate root density, uh, hi, Ankit. Hi, sir, sorry for the glitches. No yeah, problem. You can continue. No problem. Just continue. Because the pricing for each outlet is really low for a new, that serves as the biggest entry barrier. So for a new player to offer at this, uh, that level of pricing and still be able to sustain and uh, make, uh, achieve the level of profitability or root density is going to take long period of time. So uh, we don't expect uh, any, any, any big uh, new players to come and offer the service. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is a, uh, uh, because I'll just take those one question and then we can, uh, Ankit, sorry, I'll just take one question and then we can uh, get back to the Q and A. So this is a follow up to my statement just now I made. What is the reason that the industry has only one, has only done 1.5 lakh outlets out of 50 lakh possible outlets? Is it because viability of adding more outlets is low and adding more outlets will come at a lower profitability? No. Adding more outlets will come at incrementally higher and higher profitability for us because the cost of servicing an outlet in an existing road is practically zero. Incremental cost is practically zero for adding a new outlet. So uh, adding more outlets will only improve our profitability significantly. The uh, why it is only one and a half lakh outlets out of 50 lakh outlets. Just now I told you, public sector bank excluding SBI probably is about 60% of the assets under management in banks. So which means out of this 50 lakh outlets, if you also apply a thumb rule, 30 lakh outlets are probably banking with Canada Bank and the NRA Bank and Punjab National Bank and Bank of India and Bank of Baroda, none of whom offer doorstep banking as a service. But then just think of it uh, other way. Who would have thought a pharmacy will come to your doorstep five years back? Who would have thought you, you order lipstick or you order uh, this thing, specs, and then it comes to your doorstep 10 years back? But today, everything is happening there, as in your groceries and uh, ultra short deliveries and everything. People expect everything to come to their doorstep today. Sooner or later, these retail outlets will also expect the banks to come to their outlet. And the competitive pressure will force public sector banks also to start offering this as a service. So that is when it will be a, a floodgates open for this industry. Otherwise, it has grown organically as banks offer this as a premium value added service to their uh, uh, privileged customers. So from that premium to start offering this as a service to everybody, I think the pricing is not premium. At 2000 rupees per outlet, it is really low. As a starting point, I'm just saying from 2000 to 25,000, the pricing is low. But the offering of this service at your doorstep is being positioned, was positioned by foreign banks as a premium service and by uh, new private sector banks as a premium service. But it is becoming more and more mass market. As you can see, we are adding more outlets and uh, more and more clients are uh, expecting that bank come to their doorstep and uh, to uh, pick up the cash. So uh, that is the reason, and it's a nascent industry, as I told you. And then it will it will have a long way to go for reaching the levels of penetration. We we understand that the penetration levels of doorstep banking in a developed markets are in the range of 60, 67, 70 percent. So 70 out of 100 outlets will have a bank coming and picking up the cash from the outlet. So as organized sector improves in India, grows at a faster rate in India than the rest of the markets. And uh, we do expect, uh, uh, and as public sector banks start offering this as a service, we expect a substantial growth opportunity for us over a long period of time. Yes, Ankit, your next question. So apologies for that uh, uh, technical glitch. Uh, so I move on to the next question. I think you have already covered the question related to the cash circulation and UBI, right? Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll move on to the next question. So there is no debate on the fact that retail cash management is the most lucrative and high growth area in the whole cash management value chain. Our competitors have also highlighted that in their commentary. It would be great if you could give us a detailed commentary on how this business can grow in the next three to five or maybe 10 years. We're not asking for a specific guidance. Rather, our focus is to understand what aspect of this market we focus on in the past, what are we focusing now, and what all other segments in the retail space can mushroom in the future, which nobody is even talking about. Yeah. Uh, some part of this I have answered in the previous uh, question as well. The, the big picture is that the penetration levels are low. Public sector banks are not yet offering this as a service. From a retail outlet's perspective, it makes compelling case. So you just take, for example, a mall with 100 outlets. Today, each of those 100 outlets are sending one person with a bag without any security to the nearest bank. That guy stands in queue for half an hour or whatever it is, deposits that cash and comes back. 
and if it doesn't come back in half an hour, the blood pressure of the owner is going to go up. Okay, and it is got, it's not a question of uh, if it's a question of when one day that guy is going to lose that that bag due to an accident or a theft or something like that. Compared to that, the service that we offer at 2000, let us just take a case of a mid-size electronics outlet with a one lakh daily limit. He'll be paying us probably 3,500 or 4,000 rupees per month. If in one day, if that guy, the guy who deposits loses that cash, that is equivalent of four years of fees that he pays to us. Okay. So the, uh, <clears throat> the economics and say, uh, I'll put it uh, slightly differently also. We handled 1.6 lakh crores of cash last year. And our revenues were roughly about uh, 360 crores. So that is about 22, 25 basis points. Compared to that, for the same outlets, for credit cards, they will be paying 2% MDR, that is 200 basis points. So our charges are like one eighth or one tenth of what the credit card charges are. And uh, it saves substantial amount of manpower time and peace of mind to the individual outlets. And for larger outlets, chain of outlets, it gives MIS, it, it provides a lot of, in fact, we, we have developed plugins for players like Amazon or uh, Instacart, etc., who do detailed uh, analytics by outlet, by uh, product segment, by volume of transaction, etc. So our technology solution is able to provide them with all the details for them to do those analytics as well. So uh, it for a retail outlet, there's a compelling economic case to offer a service of this nature. Today, as in their bank is probably not offering this as a service because they are small or they're starting with public sector banks. Whereas for a period of time, if we are able to, as in we are banking fairly big on direct sales as well, where we go and offer this as a service to the retail outlet, if the bank is not offering that service to them. Yes, our mainstay is banks. Today, 96, 95, 96% of our revenues uh, come through banks. And we prefer to deal through banks because there is no uh, there is no debtors, there is no collection worries, there is no KYC. All of that is the bank's responsibility. Whereas if we go directly, he has to trust me to hand over such large volumes of cash. So he's going to ask who is radiant, what if you run away, what if your guy runs away with the cash? Who is responsible? Will you be insure, insuring this cash, etc.? All that I need to do concept selling to him to explain that yes, the moment he hands over the cash to me, it is as good as deposited in the bank. The entire risk is get transferred to me. He gets an SMS just like the way you deposit money in a cash deposit machine. You get an SMS immediately. So like that, you will get an the outlet will get an immediate SMS, and that is proof enough that the cash has been handed over, and it is entirely our responsibility to handle that cash. And every part of our business is completely insured. So we pay over four and a half, five crores of insurance premium in a year. Okay, so every part of it is insured for fidelity, for theft, for accidents, for force major, for every kind of uh, possibility, for storage of cash, et cetera. So uh, from a retailer's perspective, it makes eminent sense. The second, so one direct growth area for us will be the one big growth area over a longer period of time will be uh, customers of public sector banks availing this service either through the bank or through directly. The second big growth area is we have launched the Radiant Insta Credit, which is uh, which is providing instant credit for small denominations, small amounts of volumes, instant credit for the uh, retailer for the cash that he hands over to us. At a slightly higher price than otherwise he would have, he would he will be getting the cash the next day in his account. So Insta Credit is instant credit. There is no that we are not taking any credit risk for lending or anything like that. The name Insta Credit means the guy gets instant credit in their bank account within. It's like IMPS. As long as he give the cash and immediately he will his account will get credited for a slightly higher fees and uh, so that is also a high growth area. So where 
all that risk of who is radiant, what is your credibility, all that doesn't matter. He gets instant credit and then I move on. So uh, for the uh, retailer, it doesn't matter uh, what is my credibility, what is my balance sheet, what is my net worth, et cetera, so I'm no concern to them. So that also is a fairly high growth area. And then the moment we do that, it is not that eligible outlets, that two crores to 50 lakh eligible outlets becomes our market. The entire two crores becomes our market. He could be in the smallest of outlets also. For him, he is getting Insta credit. He is handing over that cash. Bank is coming to his doorstep. So uh, entire two crores becomes our potential market uh, for that. So that could be a, a high growth uh, area for us. As we had said in our earlier quarterly calls, etc., valuables logistics is a high growth area. Uh, there are two players in that market, but there are India has 1.3 lakh registered jewelers registered with BIS for hallmarking. And uh, so, whereas the existing service providers, as we understand, service hardly some 10, 8 to 10,000 jewelers. So, the rest of it are dependent on an organized market, etc. So, there is a significant opportunity for us to go in the valuable logistics segment. So, these are a few high growth areas that could propel our growth over a longer period of time. Our chairman had indicated, uh, given an indication, a longer term growth rate of 18-20% revenue growth for the company as a whole. We maintain that. Yeah. So, sir, uh, it's good that you mentioned about the direct, approaching the customers directly. If, I think it would be very helpful if you can share an example where probably uh, a certain sector of the market which probably you have not yet uh, touched today, but could be a potential customer for mm -hmm. you directly. If you can give some example, that would be very helpful to everyone. Yeah. So let us just take one petrol bunk in uh, Thane, uh, a Bharat Petroleum petrol bunk in Thane, banking with Canara Bank. So Canara Bank has not offered him a doorstep banking service. He handles large volumes of cash. And today he is sending his own person to go and deposit in that bank. So we go and knock that petrol bank and say that we will offer this service at a, this price. That price is less than the cost of one employee that he is deploying for doing this service with all the attendant risk management and all of that additional features. So he says that, okay, I will avail this service. And because, for example, he may be giving a 10 lakh rupees cash to us in a day for instance. So he's, he has to take a fairly significant counterparty exposure on us. So he will ask who is Radiant. I will give my credentials. I'm a listed company. Uh, market cap is 1,000 crore plus, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give these details. But then I will also offer him, okay, I'll give you, your daily limit is 10 lakhs. So I'll give you a 10 lakh bank guarantee. So if at the end of the day, my buy doesn't deposit your cash, you encash your bank guarantee, your risk is fully covered. So with that, we will be able to convince uh, him and get that client onboarded. And it adds to our existing route. And we deal it in the same way like we deal with the bank customer. And we collect the cash and deposit. So this way, I can add, a, say, for example, the next door to the petrol bank is a jeweler. Imagine he is banking with Bank of India. As you know, jewelers, jewelry, a lot of uh, people buy jewelry in cash. So the daily cash collections are fairly large. I can onboard him with the same way. So just put th to put things in perspective, today we deal with, say, 70,000 outlets. Just one segment petrol bunks alone, India has 85,000 plus petrol bunks. Just that one segment is more than our entire business today. Second, jewelers. I, mean, I said 1.3 lakh jewelers. Between them, they have 3 lakh jewelry outlets. So that's that one jewelry segment alone is four times our existing business, right? Mall outlets, high streets, tier three locations. So the growth opportunities in each of these where if we offer direct sales or and instructor is fat. It's fairly large for us to be optimistic about our future growth. Yeah, so... Good that uh, you brought in the point of petrol pump. So I have a question, a follow-up question here. 
See, in case of petrol pump, most of these uh, IOC and BPCL and HPCL petrol pump are basically uh, run in a manner where the end guy who is a petrol pump uh, owner is, is handling the cash on his own. It is not being done through the BPCL or the IOCL agency, right? Correct. So when you approach each one of them individually, it becomes a, the, your customer acquisition cost will go up because right now all your business comes directly through banks, right? Yeah. But when you approach these people, so do you have any strategy there where you can control your cost of acquisition or you have no option but to uh, go to them one by one and uh, ask for this? No. So even today we service certain outlets of uh, uh, IOC, BPCL, etc. These are COCO. The company owned company operated outlets. We use uh, uh, we we service them, and we service other private sector petrol bunks, Reliance Petroleum, etc. Like what you said, for public sector petrol bunks, other than Coco, it's all the decision makers are individual uh, petrol bunks. Uh, yes, we have multiple uh, strategies to do that. One of them is to offer special pricing for associations. So there is a South India IOC petrol petrol bunks a uh, petroleum dealers association. So approach those associations, offer them special pricing, etc. Uh, we also do individual door-to-door uh, uh, -to -door, uh, this thing for high-value customers. Okay, so uh, for a pharmacy, for me to go on, on board an individual single pharmacy, the cost of a customer acquisition could be high. But for uh, this thing, uh, for uh, high value customers like a jewelry or a petrol bunks, even individual outlets makes more sense to uh, onboard them directly. It's not that we are going to have a huge battalion of sales team to do this. Uh, we have, we already have almost 8,000 cash executives who pick up cash from 65,000, 70,000 outlets daily. The cost, the cash executive's job typically ends in four hours from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. At best, 3 p.m. After which, the banks don't accept cash deposits. During banking hours only, they accept cash deposits. So he is free to do what he wants after 3 p.m. So we are incentivizing our cash executives to onboard high-value customers and provide them certain monetary incentives if, these, if they are able to successfully get in. So they launched a company-wide scheme for our cash executives, and we are getting uh, uh, early leads. So at the time of IPO, our direct sales was 2%. Today, it's already more than 4%. We expect it to reach as in, uh, a significantly higher share over the period, periods to come. And uh, a higher share of uh, direct sales would lead to margin expansion as well? Sir, every new point that we add, irrespective of the route, will add to margin expansion. Whether direct, Insta credit, or bank through banks, every new point will add to our margin expansion because the cost of servicing is the same in that route. Got it. So uh, my next question is not from us, but from someone who posted it on Twitter. So through our Twitter handle, smart saying, sir, we asked uh, our uh, Twitter family to share their questions. Mm. We picked just one out of them, which I believe is very important. So he asks, if you can throw some light on your capital allocation process, that is mm. why you chose to focus on the DBJ and owning vans when the competition is focused on a much larger and fast growing monitoring and automation opportunity in a capital light fashion. Mm. So if you can throw some light on that, that would be very yeah. helpful. Yeah. So uh, uh, Radiant as a Practice has been <clears throat> very frugal. At the time of going for an IPO, we were at 300, 320 crore turnover, and our net block was just 10 crores. And the two vehicles for branch managers, regional heads, and office equipment and interiors. We did not even have a single van in our books at the time of going for an IPO. One of the purpose of going for an IPO was to add about 220 vans uh, with an outlay of about 25 crores as a risk management measure. 
so that in case there is a disruption from third party uh, vendors uh, leased vehicles etc we have some vehicles at our disposal to ensure that the the business business continuity and uh, servicing is done okay so these are strategically placed in all the locations so that some some own vehicles are available at any point of time okay but but for this one time using of ipo proceeds to buy our own vans we don't have any plans to buy any more vehicles it will be through a uh, lease route only uh, operational lease where the entire lease cost is already uh, uh, absorbed into above in uh, below before ebitda the dbj business entry also it's a frugal uh, entry as in we have not acquired any assets uh, the initial space expansions are mainly towards people so we needed 25 plus branches we need to provide adequate coverage of locations for the jewelers to entrust the parcels to us we cannot say that i will do only in two locations three locations so we need to have a reasonable uh, coverage of pin codes for us to uh, provide this service and so because it's a high value high value this thing you need a minimum a branch will have a minimum of 3 4 5 people a branch manager a night in charge a loader uh, 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 somebody to look those uh, this thing etc so that is what has resulted in our cost there is no capex it's all opex only even for our uh, the rvl we call it as rvl that is trade in valuable logistics there are no uh, uh, very very minimal fixed cost that we have done so our capital allocation is fairly uh, clear uh, the cash flow from operations roughly about 20 25% will go towards incremental working capital because our collection cycles from banks are fairly large because of the intensity of the process involved and we have fairly paid uh, high healthy dividend payouts in the past which we intend to continue in future as well and uh, rest is discretionary there is no uh, significant capex that you have planned uh, for us to uh, absorb our cash flows yeah yeah so sir you have answered part of the question as to why dbj and why owning vans made sense and how you are uh, looking at capital allocation but the second part of the question was that uh, the competition is uh, uh, looking at a larger and faster growing monitoring and automation opportunity uh, so would you yeah. want to throw so, some no, okay here? i'll tell you no no see we our services as it is is as in extremely technology intensive and we have over a period of time probably would have made 30 40 30 30 we crore plus of investment in our technology but all of which is absorbed in operating costs and there is no capitalized software solution technology etc within our balance sheet but at the same time don't as in the sense we are unique in the sense that our entire business is only retail cash management but a substantial portion of our business is only retail cash management so whereas the peers that you are comparing with will be offering a whole host of other services like i said value of just your cash replenishment in an atm could be less than 10000 but the total value of for a managed service provider in an atm could be upwards of 30 35000 rupees the salary for a security guard the rent that you pay for the premise the air condition and its maintenance the atm machine maintenance the software switches all of that adds to the overall value even what is the margins in increment each one of those is a different debate but the revenue that revenue opportunity that a single atm will provide compared to just the cash replenishment is very different yes we do have over a period of time a longer term perspective where we can offer a much wider services to our retail customers but there are fairly long term in future at this point of time the retail cash management is the lucrative segment within the cash logistics our intention is to go far deeper by offering this service to more and more and more customers rather than stretch ourselves into other services to the end customers because we feel we believe as in we are playing in a small corner of a big uh, ground and offering the same service to 
50 times larger number of client base is where our, our salvation, our longer term growth is in rather than providing more and more service to the same existing clients. That has been the philosophy at this point of time. Yes, there are enough and more opportunities that we can provide. Being a security services company, we can provide guarding services to the same customers. We can provide overall risk management, including integrating security cameras and alerts and things like that, et cetera. But those are, as in the sense, in our mind, ancillary businesses with relatively lesser margins over a longer period of time. The bigger growth plan is adding more points and that there's a endless growth opportunities. Great. So, uh, so it makes it more clear as to how we are focused only on retail cash management and how our focus continues to be in adding more points, adding more customers and trying to serve those customers directly rather than through banks. Right. So you mentioned both, on the, both, yeah. ba both banks as well as that. Both banks as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Our predominant dependence on banks will continue to be so. Today, we are 95% of our revenues are from banks. And we hope it continues because we are happy to provide the service through banks. Right. Because it is a lot more easier for us in terms of customer acquisition. Bank does the business development for us. Uh, right. There are no collection challenges. Banks does the collection and we are we have to just uh, uh, collect it from the banks. You've never had any bad debt experience with banks, etc. So it is a lot more operationally uh, convenient and uh, smoother if we deal through banks. But then if if it is a, if, if you are a customer and you are banking with Canada Bank or a uh, Dana Bank or a Punjab National Bank, you don't even have an option. So we want to provide that optionality to that customer so that they can avail a service of this nature. So that's where our focus will be on the direct sales. Right. So moving on on the same topic of focusing on growth in the current segment of the market where, where we are in. You uh, shared a little bit about InstaCredit, but for the benefit of our viewers, I would want you to further expand on it. What is the purpose, the value it provides, the current scale at which you are in the product, and where do you see it in the next five years? If you can be in more detail in your answer, that would be very helpful. I, because I, many of our viewers still don't understand. No, what I will it. have to take a rain check on this particular question. Uh, it is highly uh, uh, competitive information at this point of time. Uh, sure. We have just recently launched this. We don't want sure. to give too much uh, this thing. And we ourselves are... Uh, fine-tuning our technology systems, uh, risk management, all of that in that. So we don't have a, a publicly disclosed target of where this instructor will be. But all I can say is that at this point of time, it is restricted to small volume cash. Daily limits are very low and small volume cash where because it is expensive. So a petrol bank can never imagine to get an instructor credit of 10 lakhs in a day because the cost will be prohibitively expensive for them. The rest, smaller outlets can avail the service who don't mind paying a slightly higher cost if they are able to get the things from credit. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Uh, no, as in, uh, because it is way too early for us, we just recently launched. So uh, we have to see how the market accepts it and uh, how it grows because we can give any uh, longer term projection on this. Yes, we are betting big on it, but don't want to commit in numbers. Sure, sir. So keeping the uh, projections aside, just wanted to understand who is the uh, target customer in case of Insta Credit? Who are you serving on what is the market there? Yeah, like I said, all smaller outlets where daily collections are low, who low otherwise will not. I, as in innocence, our regular business, our daily limit starts at 50,000 rupees for our regular uh, retail cash management business. Here, it will be lower than that. Okay, it could be 10,000, 20,000, 25,000, some of that range, daily collections are there. So where they can get instructed, which will add incrementally to our revenues without adding much to the costs and uh, improve our root density and thereby the profitability is what our expectations. And the customers are willing to uh, bear that extra cost. Yeah. Okay. Any outlet when they are uh, when they are offering you a credit card service, they are willing to bear two percent cost. Right. right. This is like one eighth, one tenth of that. 
So there is no unit economics. Always we we make sure that our unit economics for the customer for the end customer is always highly in favor. So they don't think twice before availing the service. Yeah, and uh, for us also incrementally it will not hurt our margins. No, right? Because no, because the cost of servicing that is as an instance it's in the same route. Okay. So, Incremental cost of servicing will not be very high. Got it. So moving on, sir. Uh, so tell us about our fintech acquisition of Ace Money. As in, to that, please touch upon your view on the micro ATM market in India, the competitive intensity, and most importantly about the RBI's payment infrastructure development fund (PIDF) and the advantage Radiant has by being one of the twelve vendors approved under this scheme. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, big picture, like I said, two crore outlets are there. Total number of outlets that accept some form of payment infrastructure today is 85 lakhs. So RBA publishes this data regularly, which means roughly about 45% penetration, 55% of the outlets don't have any form of payment infrastructure at all. Okay, so you imagine this as tier three, tier four, uh, far off locations, Northeast, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Chhattisgarh. As in, you, you can think of those kind of outlets where the payment infrastructure is not yet existing. So the uh, obviously the government wants to improve uh, digital digital payment payment uh, digital payment infrastructure in every possible outlet. So there is a scheme called PM Swanidhi, which is even the street vendors should should have the uh, facility to accept. Uh, uh, should should avail credit for that they need to have be part of the system and should be able to accept uh, digital uh, digital payments as well okay so several initiatives are being done our uh, our focus in the uh, uh, acquisition of ace money was to offer as in, in a sense the capture the retail outlets that are otherwise not part of our retail cash management, offer them this additional service as well. And this micro ATM, as in the micro ATMs, which is uh, uh, it's a simple low cost machine where that can even function as a banking outlet or a micro ATM outlet where the, uh, uh, the user can use any credit card, credit debit cards, or even their thumb impressions to, uh, through other enable payment systems to withdraw cash or deposit cash in any, any retail outlet. Okay, so uh, for a small fee, and the fee is charged across the entire spectrum of uh, the, uh, including the outlet and to the service provider like Radiant Taste Money and the bank. Okay, it is shared across this hierarchy. So uh, we believe the number of ATMs in the country is not growing as much. That is stagnating at one two percent. But the micro ATMs already we have uh, I think uh, sixteen lakh micro ATMs in the country. Okay, and that number could be. As in, I think it it the the RBA target that number should be fifty lakhs or one crore or something like that. Very large number, so that. Every outlet, every retail outlet is practically a bank. So you can go deposit cash, withdraw cash from your account with your credit card or your Aadhaar card. And uh, you're not dependent on bank branches, bank branch opening to, uh, this is larger part of the financial inclusion scheme of the government. So uh, we do see a fairly good opportunity there. Uh, so government through RBA provides a subsidy for providing to bring an outlet for the first time into the infrastructure in the payment infrastructure space. So it could be digital, which is just adding a QR code or physical, which means providing a point of sale machine or a micro ATM machine through which you can do card transactions. So uh, PADF, I think the scheme is fairly detailed and it is available in public domain for anyone to see. But we see a large growth opportunity. The ACE, ACE money, the company that we acquired, uh, has a fairly strong software and uh, relationships and already well-established in Kerala market. 
and our idea is that with our acquisition and our pan india network we will be able to scale up that pan india and uh, so uh, there is a, there's some set of synergies with the uh, uh, retail cash management as well which is that see today uh, micro atm probably in a busy area will run out of cash by 10 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock 11 a.m because in micro atm the cash is paid from the till of that outlet so the from the cash uh, this thing from the cash register so if he doesn't have cash he cannot give uh, the customer what he asks okay and atm anytime money as in somebody should be having it should be available to a customer whenever the store is open Otherwise, the customer is not going to believe is a reliable uh, reliable uh, point where he can get the cash that he wants so uh, we will be providing cash replenishment to this micro ATMs as a service. We have fairly large amount of cash in the hinterland, and we can use that to replenish this uh, ATMs using our cash. Uh, so that will help us in generating revenues for the replenishment, as well as reduce our cost of depositing that cash in other ways in a bank. So that is the synergy that we see for uh, Radiant. And uh, so fairly large growth opportunities, but again, uh, uh, early days of our acquisition. And so uh, we'll wait to see before we can give uh, specific guidance or longer term guidance. Thank you so much uh, for the detailed answer for this one. Uh, just one thing, uh, I know the PIDF document is well there on the internet, anyone can read. If you can just briefly explain what is the scheme and what the advantage Radiant is getting from this scheme. Uh, that would be very helpful, sir. Yeah. So the, the scheme allows for giving 300 rupees to the service provider if they are able to in a, onboard a merchant with a QR code, simple QR code. And it, it gives up to 10,000 rupees per outlet if you are able to onboard him with a physical infrastructure, which is a either a micro ATM machine or a point of sale machine with software, with the uh, payment uh, gateway and uh, connect, connected to any of these uh, payment service providers like MasterCard or Visa or Rupee or things like that. So if you're able to onboard him fully with the physical, uh, this thing, it is uh, up to 10,000 rupees. So each service provider has to justify the cost and the cost is reimbursed by RBI up to 90% in remote locations and up to 75% in other locations. And that is linked, the payment is also linked to two parts. One is when we, at the time of installation, 75% of that you get, and balance 25% is paid after that outlet has a certain minimum number of transactions demonstrated in a period of 12 months. So uh, the, as in the, it is funded through a small CES, that is levied on every digital transaction, just like the way NHA got funded with a small one rupee petrol cess, which is help, which helped NHA create a nationwide highway infrastructure. This is a similar cess that is levied on every digital transaction, and that cess is used to fund this PIDF, and that is used for creating the entire highway of payment infrastructure across the country, so that every one of those two crore outlets should have a opportunity for the customer to make uh, either a card or a QR code or a digital payment. So yeah. that's a huge growth opportunity for us because it's underpenetrated. And, but that is a way to go because physical ATMs are expensive, capital intensive, and uh, most banks have lost economic interest in putting, adding more ATMs. The moment RBA made any bank card can be used in any other ATM for up to five times in a month for free. There is no economic incentive for any bank to add any more ATMs. Right. Totally. So that is why you are seeing a plateauing of growth in the number of ATMs that are getting added and a sharp growth in the micro ATMs that are growing. The ATMs are 16 lakh micro ATMs today and uh, expecting it to go to one crore or something like that, some crazy number over the next few years. And this PIDF will help in that growth. So we want to capitalize on that opportunity. 
more than that, one time is the infrastructure, but once the infrastructure is created, Chase Money will be able to get some recurring revenues as well for, as part of every transaction that is being done in those outlets. So over a period of time, the transaction revenues will far outweigh the initial infrastructure uh, setup costs and hence have a fairly bullish growth trajectory for Chase Money over a period of time. Yeah. So one last follow-up this uh, particular point of PID here. Uh, any thoughts on why only 12 vendors are approved under the scheme? Is it uh, difficult? No, no, to... no. So there are, there are, see, generally there is a, some set of people, particularly those who are PE funded and etc. They don't want to do anything to do with the government or subsidy or anything like that. So okay. either they subsidize themselves, they give that machine for free, or they collect a small amount of money from the vendor uh, which is below the cost and still do. So they are in a hurry to get this uh, out uh, this thing done. I, I'm not sure it's 12, it could be about 25, 26 players are uh, this thing, but more active ones are few that we see in the market. Oh. We've taken a call that yes, this is a, a good scheme and we need to capitalize on that and help, particularly help you know, having tremendous success in Northeast, in Jammu and Kashmir, et cetera, where we have good presence. Not everybody has presence in those markets. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll deviate a little from the business related questions. Now I'll come to financials and uh, uh, numbers related questions. So from FY18 to FY19, our revenues jumped uh, only from 195 crore to 221 crores. No, that is the year uh, when we stopped our ATM business and uh, the losses for uh, from ATM uh, this thing affected us in both uh, 17, 18, and not so much in 19, and 20 would have been a even further jump. That is because the losses from the uh, core uh, ATM, the, the, the ATM business got abated or removed. And our, uh, otherwise it's a secular growth in our core operating business because the margins which were in mid-teens in 14, 15, 16, moved up to 20 plus in the 19, in 2021, et cetera, and moved further to 25 plus in the last two years. That's a purely an operating leverage. Yeah, if that, we, uh, if we small that. period between 16 to 19, there was a deviation because. Yeah, if you small leave deviation that. in the period 16 to 19 because ATM losses skewed that picture. Right. No, but even if you look at the last five years number, our sales have roughly doubled, but our profit have become 10 x. So for the benefit of our listener, please explain the reasons for the same as to, and I'm not asking for a definite guidance, but just directionally, would we continue be continue to be on the same path in the future as well, where a small no, no, increase, the, 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 yeah. Yeah. the no small increase in revenue having disproportionate increase in profits, that's not how we present it. What we are saying is that the business is, has a high degree, high operational leverage, which means you need to set up that infrastructure, the cost, the guards, the drivers, the vans, all of that is more fixed in nature. So once you establish that cost, any incremental points that are added in that route, a, a significantly high share of it translates to gross margin and EBITDA. So as the route density improves, the operating leverage helps us in uh, getting a, a higher EBITDA from that uh, from that incremental revenues. So that is an operating leverage. That is the nature of this industry. And in fact, incidentally, that is that similar nature of that industry in that valuable logistics, which triggered us to get into that segment as well. Because once you cover that basic costs of infrastructure, Incremental revenue, incremental revenues have a disproportionate share on the profits. Right, right, got it. So uh, moving on to the next question related to these financials and numbers. So at the time of IPO in January 2023, we guided for a 20 to 25 percent growth in revenue for no. FY22. Not 25 percent, definitely not. 18 okay. to 20 percent is what we had. Okay. Sure. So, higher are nine month results prove that even that 20% is difficult to achieve. So, can you throw some light here as to what happened? 
So we we'll answer this in the in our uh, uh, quarterly calls as well. So uh, the our growth in uh, initially in first uh, uh, period we had a, a setback in our petroleum sector growth because of the Ukraine and there is a opportunistic diversion of refining products from catering to Indian markets to European markets. So there's a sharp drop in volumes by uh, the petroleum players that, that's what directing it to India, particularly our clients, not that entire uh, this thing, as I said, we don't have too many public sector clients there. So that was a setback. It has almost come back to normal, still 20% shortfall of uh, our peak revenues on that segment, but still it has come back to normal. So there is a, otherwise without this setback, that segment would have given us a higher growth. Today, we are just catching up to come back to the previous levels. So that is one part of one, one impact that we had post IPO. The second uh, uh, part is that we, we did face some challenge in the e-com logistics segment, which is where uh, uh, slow volume uh, outlets, uh, as in a sense, found uh, alternate routes or there was a churn in our uh, number of points that we serviced. So uh, that actually had a uh, impact on our revenues. We are hoping that our, our launch of Radiant Insta Credit will, will be able to uh, arrest that decline and we should be able to recover that. But if you see individual segment wise, our organized retail has grown at more than that guidance level. Our BFSA has grown almost at that guidance level. Our e-commerce grown at that guidance level, et cetera. Petroleum and uh, uh, this thing, we, we had good growth from the small finance banks, et cetera, much higher than the guidance levels. Whereas uh, the e-commerce, logistics, and the petroleum sectors, and some to some extent, uh, railways also, not for any specific reasons, as in that is the nature of that growth, that business, uh, had lower than the guidance growth, which affected our overall profitability. We are taking corrective measures. We expect that the growth trajectory should come back sooner rather than later. Got it. Sure. So uh, moving on to the next question, sir. So investors in the public market uh, often uh, dislike companies that show a pattern of a sudden rise in the margin just before the IPO and the margin going down after the IPO. Our operating margin was around 25% in the past. In FY23, it experienced a big jump to 30%. And after the IPO in FY24, at least for the first nine months uh, where the results have been out, it has fallen to less than 20%. So could you explain the reasons as to, as in, can you, uh, do you think we can expect the company to go back to 30% operating margins in the future? I'm not asking. No, I want to give any specific when you is on 30% yeah. or et cetera. Definitely that's not, uh, we don't want to give that guidance. But uh, uh, as I said, see, the operating leverage is a twin-edged sword. If the revenues were at the same growth rate, just like the, what we answered just now, if the revenue growth had, had been at that same 20%, 18, 20% level, our EBITDA would have been far higher than, uh, disproportionately higher than what you saw. So just like the way incremental revenue has a disproportionate impact on EBITDA, shortfall in revenue has a disproportionate impact on it. That is point number one. So point number two, this was a period when we had significant growth areas. As in, we did uh, enter into the uh, DBJ segment. So that is a period where we had to make that investment in terms of branch, network, et cetera. Today we have as in 50 vans and 100-member uh, crew plus 100-member branch uh, people. But incremental re re revenues from that will take some time. So that's an investment. You know, see, we don't have a concept of our capital concept of capitalizing any of these, all of those are going into the directly to the PNL. So that has had a negative impact on our EBITDA, but I have to see this as an investment in our future growth, long-term sustainable growth. We did expect, we do expect that this is a high growth opportunity for us. And so I'm looking at it as a uh, investment rather than as a erosion in our profitability. So these are the two key reasons uh, for the, uh, drop in profitability compared to what we had uh, this thing. IPO has nothing to do with this. It's a, uh, it's a conscious management decision to improve our, uh, to expand into a new business area. 
that had uh, increased the cost. And nothing, what happened with the e-commerce logistics or what happened with our petroleum are extraneous factors, nothing true with that. So no, I, I want to link this to the uh, IPO, pre-IPO, post-IPO kind of scenario. But we do expect that we will revert to mean uh, kind of profitability uh, over, over the next few quarters. That's what I think. Sure, sir. So uh, you mentioned about the e-com logistics uh, issue. Uh, just a follow up on that. Uh, have we lost any customer there? We have not lost any customers. Okay. We have lost a few points. So can you low, low volume points? Okay. Which uh, which they found an alternate route and which we are addressing now. But otherwise, we have not lost any customers. See, our customers are banks. Definitely, you have not lost any banks since our inception. Unless a bank goes out of business, there's one RBS bank was there, it just they exited India. That is the only customer we had lost. End customers also, in this segment, you have not lost any end customers. All the end customers continue to do business with us. Just that few points were lost because of the low volume uh, points that we are trying to address. Yeah. Okay. That was the game again, sir. So I'll take a few questions from the chat box now, and we're coming to the end of the session. I need now. to wind in another five, seven minutes, uh, block till yeah. 12. Yeah, yeah. Next appointment is there. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Sure. I, I'll be quick. Uh, so one question is by uh, Disha Gandhi. Uh, she asks, can you please throw some light on different types of contracts you have with your customers? And do you see this converging toward a, towards a particular format? See, our customers are, uh, as in our first customer is Deutsche Bank, who still continue to be our customer. We have not lost any customers. Typically, our relationships are fairly long term. Uh, with most customers, we sign a three-year contract. With the few, we sign a one-year contract. We just, bo both of them have an auto-renewal clause in this. The process of onboarding a customer, particularly a bank customer, is fairly uh, uh, arduous and long takes five, six months to onboard a customer, new bank. If uh, tomorrow a new bank comes in, they will do our audit of our process, systems, technology, risk management, all of that financial analysis, all of that before, because they are interesting huge volumes of cash. To put things in perspective, we handle 500 crores of cash every day. In a, on a long week, uh, Monday after long weekend, I'll be handling 1,200 crores of cash every day. My market cap is not that much. My net worth is not that much. Every day I'm doing this. Okay. So they need to have complete confidence in us. So we are actually in a perpetual mode of audit by our banks. Foreign banks, etc., will have their quarterly audits or half yearly audits. Private sector banks have their half yearly audits. Public sector banks will have some annual audits, etc. So we are perpetually in an audit. So we have long-term contracts. So once a client onboards us, very difficult, very, very costly proposition for them to get out of us, get out of this contract. Okay, to find an alternate source because then they have to spend the same amount of time and resources not putting somebody else. Our contracts are long term. Uh, and see, we add I mean, 30, 40, 50 points every day. So neither us nor the bank have the wherewithal to sit and calculate how much is the distance to the nearest bank, how much kilometers, what is the fuel rate, et cetera, et cetera. There is no such uh, analysis done for each point. So we enter into a long-term contract with the pricing matrix based on the distance, a uh, broad distance breakup, and then within city limits, beyond city limits, far off locations, and based on the daily limits. Daily limit will be 50,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakh, 5 lakh, 10 lakh, 20 lakh, 25 lakh, 1 crore, et cetera. So based on the daily limit and the bucket of distance, it automatically fits into that matrix and we start charging the price from the next day onwards. And this is a fairly, what we believe is our contract across banks, as well as a particular bank's contract across service providers are fairly uniform. There is no, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, there is no big difference in pricing or broad terms between, between banks for us and between service providers or a bank. 
Yeah. Okay, that addresses uh, Misha's question. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sir, there are a few questions, and in the interest of time, I may not be able to ask now. But uh, can we share those questions over email so that I can share your response to the uh, viewers later on? Uh, I will just check. Uh, as an in instance, obviously, we will have our quarterly calls. Uh, most of your investors are most welcome to attend and uh, raise those questions as well. Uh, but uh, I don't think I'll be able to do private one-on-one -on -one, uh, email exchanges and response to those queries. Sure, so, sure. Uh, appreciate it. We'll try to address as much as possible in the next few times. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, so, we'll be happy to do a similar calls after our full year results as well. Sure, sir. Yeah, so thank you so much for answering all the questions patiently and in detail. It, this was very, very, very helpful for me and my team and also for our members. And I'm sure people who will watch the recording uh, will also find it very helpful. Uh, but before we leave you, it would be great if you can share your larger vision and mission for the company in the years to come. And also what are the important risks that can prevent you to achieve your vision and mission. So with this, uh, I think we can end the session. Yeah. I think uh, uh, Chairman has given uh, his longer term vision as in uh, <clears throat> the want to be the most respected and uh, continue to be the market leader in the retail cash management segment. And our vision is one day, if you want cash at your home, we should be able to provide. Just like you order a Swiggy or Zomato for your food, you order cash certain denominations at your home, we should be able to provide at your home. So it's a really longer term vision where 140 crore people are our target customers. But at this point of time, our focus is B2B. Uh, we will be providing this service first through banks, then through direct customers, then through Instacredit, and or eventually through every, every individual. And uh, similarly, similar adjacent opportunity is where our gold jewelry, uh, valuable logistics is. It also has an immense growth opportunity. We should be able to uh, uh, assume a significant market share in that segment as well for the medium term. And Ace Money is a very important uh, acquisition. Uh, over a longer period of time, the, the growth in the digital uh, transactions uh, will we will be able to capitalize on that growth opportunity as well through our uh, uh, ace money acquisition so uh, we act as a uh, uh, in a sense a risk mitigant as well and uh, yeah so risks we have highlighted that in the past as in it is run like a as in a sense chairman is uh, from x mill x uh, army uh, our senior management, a lot of people, as in Colonel Benz, Colonel Rai, as in all of them are ex uh, army, uh, army veterans. So the company's operations are run like a military discipline. Okay. Uh, so our cash losses are the lowest in the industry. You can compare it with other, any other players, and it is not an happenstance. It has been consistently so for 19 years of our operations and will continue to be so. So that is also a, a, a key mode because such large volumes of cash, things would go quickly all right. I think there's serious amount of cash losses, et cetera. Customer confidence in us could erode and uh, that could be a, a vicious uh, downward spiral. So continuous focus on operations, risk management, uh, et cetera, is uh, very important. And uh, we, we have demonstrated that in the last 19 years. And we hope we'll be able to continue our operations in a risk free manner in the uh, long period to come. Okay. Thanks very thank much, Ankit, for your uh, the opportunity to present the management's case. And thank you so much, sir, for uh, taking time out and sharing everything in detail. And thank you so much for our audience also who have patiently listened to us and uh, asked some really good questions. And uh, with this, we come to the end of the presentation. And we'll share the recording link soon. Uh, sir, I'll share it with you separately as well and we'll share with the audience as yeah. well. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for making this a very uh, informative and uh, knowledgeable session for all the investors in the country. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day, everyone. Good day. Bye.